So hello, and welcome to today's Security Boulevard webinar. I'm Charles Collegy, and I'm your host for today's uh, event. Thank you for joining us. Uh, before we get into our presentation on a new approach to secure web gateways, I want to give uh, some of the uh, housekeeping material, and, uh, and we'll start with just a little discussion on uh, what our big maker platform has uh, available for us. And the first, so if you notice on the platform, there's a chat uh, button on the right-hand side. So feel free to send us notes, send us uh, comments, comment amongst yourselves. And, you know, if you'd like, uh, put down where you're from, say hello. It's always interesting to see uh, where the people are, are uh, joining us from uh, today. You'll also see a QA and a uh, button. That's where you can go into and ask us uh, questions. We will be taking questions for today at the uh, end of the session, or if the question uh, comes up, we will answer that right then and there. And we have uh, handouts today. And interestingly, uh, uh, Menlo Security just dropped, uh, just released their Cyber Edge uh, 2021 threat report yesterday. And that's in our handout section. So uh, feel free to, to download that after the event. Now, today's event webinar will be uh, recorded. So you will receive a email link when it's over and you can go and take a look at it in case you had to uh, uh, drop out or you want to uh, refresh it or share it with uh, uh, some of your colleagues. So. Uh, that will be will be coming uh, too, so you can watch it on demand anytime uh, you'd like. The other thing is, at the end of today's session, we will be giving out four twenty-five dollar Amazon gift cards. So feel free to stay and listen to see if you won, and if you do win, then you will receive an email uh, of the uh, telling you how how to collect. So today's. Today's uh, session is going to be on a new approach to secure web gateways. Breaking up with your on-premise web proxy is a no-brainer. So in today's uh, environment, uh, there's a lot going on. We have 75% uh, of the uh, workforce working at home. So web uh, content is very important. Uh, threats are, are rising, so we need to be able to uh, address those issues. And with us today to tell us how to uh, take care of some of that is Nick Edwards, Vice President of Product Marketing for Menlo Security. So welcome, Nick. I'm going to let you uh, introduce yourself. And again, there will be questions at the uh, end of the session. So put them into the Q&A and uh, chat with us uh, during the uh, uh, event. And we're all happy to uh, uh, see if we can answer any of them. Nick, uh, you can introduce yourself and then take on to the uh, event. Okay. Thank you, Charles. Hey, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. My name is Nick Edwards. I'm the uh, Vice President of Product Management at Menlo Security. And today I want to talk about something that most of us have lived with, some of us have procured, deployed, and installed, and that's uh, an on-premise web proxy. And I think in many ways, our relationships to technology are very much like our relationships to people. Um, sometimes they're great, sometimes they're not so great. Sometimes we stick around too long. Um, sometimes we may eject too early. Um, what I wanna make the case for today is that our relationships to the on-premise web proxy um, is, is worth revisiting. Um, the world has changed dramatically since these were invented, um, not only in terms of you know the technological implications of how they're used, but also just how we work as you know, knowledge workers, as professionals, as people you know, you know, out in the field or on the manufacturing line. And there's a new way to to deliver similar capabilities, but also enhanced capabilities that are in line with what uh, you know the current threat landscape, um, compliance landscape, and overall user experience demands. And that's what I want to talk about today. So let's just dig straight in and go back. Back to the beginning, you know, the, the first web proxy essentially was based off of um, a project, you know, called CERN HTTPD. Um, it was based off of a web server, um, you know, Tim Berners-Lee, 
Ari Henrik, a lot of very smart guys in the early 90s invented this. And this was a great concept. This was at the beginning of the internet. And in many ways, it was, you know, basically designed to, you know, provide this, in a sense, a buffer and, and a cache for people who were accessing the web. Um, at the, in those days, it was based off port 80. Um, it allowed, you know, the organizations to run this kind of at the perimeter, very much, you know, similar to like a firewall. Um, and in, in all these cases, they were software running on general purpose servers, relatively easy to manage and relatively straightforward. But a lot's changed since then. For one, um, internet traffic volume has continued to skyrocket. This chart is from a semiconductor company um, that references, you know, the, their current view of the world. Um, you know, in the old days, in the 1990s, it was, you know, roughly 0 0.001 petabytes a month worth of traffic. Um, over the global internet backbone. Now it's over 200 exabytes a month. Um, you know, it's so high that these these are words we don't even use in our current vernacular. You know, we hear kilobyte, megabyte, gigabyte, maybe terabyte, maybe petabyte, but you know, when was the last time we used exabytes? Well, you know, every day there's, you know, close to, you know, exabytes worth of traffic going over the internet backbone. And it's only going up. So what does this mean to the existing kind of, you know, legacy concepts of web proxies. Well, you need more hardware to do this. Um, you know, the, the traditional days of, you know, okay, maybe you'd want to stack one or two up and that'd be good. You know, customers that we engage with, you know, are, are continuing to think about traffic volumes, think about the future and revisiting how they are planning their existing hardware rollout and looking for alternatives. Um, another area that's changed dramatically is HTTPS. HTTPS is a concept that is driven by, you know, authentication, privacy, and basically security. It's based on, you know, SSL and TLS, and it essentially encrypts the sessions um, between, you know, the end user client and the web server. Um, and this has been a tremendous benefit for us as users because we can access websites more securely. Cyber criminals, hackers, you know, bad nation states don't have the ability to peer into that session. So all of our commerce and all of our, you know, sensitive communications can be secured. And, you know, this was not done at the beginning of um, kind of web, web proxies and web servers. This came shortly thereafter, invented by a company called Netscape. Um, some of you probably remember this uh, company, Mark Andreessen founded it. Um, and it's, it's a great concept. And, you know, this, this chart here is from Google and it shows roughly you know, the percentage of page loads, you know, on a Chrome browser, you know, by platform. And it's almost all of the platforms are over 90% of page loads being in HTTPS. Linux is a, a little bit slower, but still it's in the 70 to 80% range. Now, the, the benefits are clear. The downsides are that anytime you do these types of cryptographic calculations to, you know, create a session that's secure and decrypt it and so forth, there's an overhead that's imputed by the CPUs and the overall compute platform. And so it ends up having a tremendous performance impact on throughput, you know, roughly depending upon who you ask, between eight to 10X of a performance degradation when you kind of enable HTTPS on a like for like session. And on top of that, cyber criminals have gotten smarter and they start trying to encrypt their, uh, you know, their sessions within an HTTPS session. So their payloads and some of the things that they're doing from a malware perspective attempt to hide in that, which essentially demands that web proxies decrypt almost everything. And the net result of this, more hardware is needed. Um, you know, over time, hardware, you know, the, the early versions of web proxies evolved from software running on general purpose servers to more appliance-based solutions. And that was a big you know, ad, uh, advancement in the technology, but for things like traffic volume and HTTPS sessions, this ultimately results in companies needing to deploy, deploy more to keep their users safe and to minimize any level of performance degradation, latency, and kind of capacity constraints. Another change that's happened dramatically since 1991, and we've seen a lot of it in the past year, is remote work. You know, before COVID-19, uh, you know, in the 2019, 2020 timeframe before the pandemic hit, you know, roughly 20% of the workforce work from home, you know, uh, 
c- occasionally, you know, a small in number work from home all the time. And I was always envious of these people. No, this is great. You know, they're able to work from home. I'm slogging through the commute. I live in the Bay Area. Commutes are kind of tough. But after COVID hit, you know, roughly 71% of the workforce worked from home. You know, some were, were lucky enough to, you know, be these digital nomads. They're, they're living in their vans, going from place to place, staying in Airbnbs, logging on to, you know, either a Wi-Fi hotspot or they have the, the cellular connections with them and wherever they're traveling. And, and this has been, in many cases, a tremendous improvement to productivity. Um, and, and employees were able to really continue to deliver value and accelerate productivity. Um, and, and that was a big advantage. And of course, during COVID, it helped us keep more of our, our workers and colleagues safe. The downside is, though, you know, were we ready for that level of a transition? You know, before COVID, when you have you know, 20% or less of the workforce working remotely, it was pretty straightforward. They would, you know, turn on their VPN. That traffic would get backhauled to the corporate HQ, corporate data center, and then it would go back out to the internet from there. Um, and you could apply security and access policy in one or small handful of, you know, centralized locations. But after COVID, and just in generally when we look towards the future, where you know more and more companies have a permanent work from home policy, or if you don't have a permanent work from home policy. More and more people will be working um, remotely, you know, two to three to four days a week. In this model, the VPN traffic and the VPN, you know, concentrators just can't keep up. Um, so what we're seeing a lot of organizations do is, is rapidly embrace split tunnel VPNs to offload traffic. Um, and in many cases, um, you know, kind of consider a, a best effort approach towards ha- handling their users and kind of how they access the, the internet, um, as well as corporate applications. And the net result of a lot of this is just kind of an in- increased, um, you know, demand for, you know, reconsidering their network, um, reconsidering where they need hardware. And in many cases, you know, in this kind of stage that organizations are in, they're trying to develop more and more breakout places for their remote users to have centralized policy and security uh, rules in place. So bigger footprint required, more management required on top of that for the users and the IT staff. And another big change um, is that the browser is the new office. You know, when you think about 20 years ago, um, meetings were in person, meetings were in the conference room, you might have someone call in. Um, You know, some cases, you know, they would have to write in a whiteboard. And I remember the days of taking pictures and sending them to our colleagues so they could see what we wrote in a whiteboard. But today, 75% of users spend their workday in a web browser or in a a virtual meeting, a Zoom session, you know, very much like this. And I think the Google says that the future of your enterprise, your business is the browser. It's in the browser. The browser is the new office. So, you know, if you have an office and you go into the office, there's a you know, receptionist, there's security, there's cameras, you know, there are badges needed to go from here to there. And that's great. You can control who gets in. You know, you have some ability to control what people do when they're there from a security and safety point of view. You have some capabilities to, to monitor if people are, you know, kind of trying to exfiltrate information. I used to work in um, government slash military environments. And, you know, sure enough, you know, as we would leave, you know, there was pop inspections to see if people were, you know, exfiltrating information or content. That's all great uh, in person, but in the web browser world, that's not effective. It won't work. So the question is, you know, well, how, how can we control that? Well, it's only been increasing. You know, it's cloud and SaaS applications have been dramatically accepted. You know, on the upper right hand side here, you have a chart that highlights the number of SaaS apps by company size. And if you're a small company, maybe you're a law firm or a small shop, you know, even then the average number of SaaS apps is roughly 111. You know, if you're talking about a company that's over 10,000 users, 10,000 employees, you probably have footprints all around the world um, in different regions, different geos. There's different applications that are relevant to different geos. You know, the average SaaS application in use by any company is roughly 650, you know, and that's massive. And then on the bottom left, you'll see the the top most popular apps by kind of customer count. And this is in 2019. This data is from Okta. And, you know, you'll see obviously Microsoft Office 365. That's great. You know, 
we use that at our company, Salesforce, we use that, AWS. At our company, at Menlo, we are using virtually all of these applications. Um, and we're, you know, 300 plus employee company. You know, think about companies that are our size times 10 all around the world. There are these tools in place and the different versions of these that are relevant to those geographies and so forth. And what this means is that important data, applications, workflows, conversations are happening in these apps and they're being stored in these applications and they're outside of the corporate network. Um, the web proxies that exist today aren't really designed to do that. So, so what's happened, we've deployed additional tools from other vendors that integrate with these on-premise web proxies to manage things like you know, access and controls and so forth. And <clears throat> in conjunction with that, the last change I wanna highlight is that security has continued to um, be a challenge. And, and this chart highlights the types of threats that have evolved since the advent of the internet. You know, back in the early 90s, we're looking at you know, insider threats and physical threats and network attacks and, and these sorts of things. Um, and then evolving to you know, hackers, Trojans, worms, viruses. And today it's gotten more and more sophisticated as you, know, you have the nation states who are sponsoring cyber espionage. I mean, there's definitely kind of a, a Cold War type of model going on via the cyber landscape on a regular basis. Um, and you know, I think it used to be that you know, we could stop, you know, we could help prevent the mistake by kind of your average user. Um, in a lot of cases, we could protect against, you know, some threats that were coming in because they're relatively blunt and kind of brute force. An example might be, you know, um, credential stuffing and those sorts of things, you know, dictionary attacks. But nowadays, you know, you even have kind of the Jason Bourne of cybercrime who are going to be targeting a small number of individuals. And for a lot of organizations and a lot of anti, you know, the malware, antivirus tools, they're not designed for this notion of a very targeted attack that might be custom and bespoke for one company and a small set of users. So the attacks are occurring um, more frequently and they're increasing in complexity. And so this, this has implications for kind of the legacy world where you had on-premise proxies. You know, in the old days you would have, okay, a firewall, great. Um, you would have a proxy. And of course, as I mentioned, just due to scalability, you would need to have multiple proxies. You need to have high availability, redundancy and backup. And then you would typically need to have these in multiple locations around the world for your organization. Okay, and then if you wanted to have you know, antivirus, you might need to have another kind of augmentation for that. Um, sandboxing tools came out for advanced persistent threats. Those were great additions to the security landscape, but those were new boxes and hardware that you need to manage. DLP solutions, reporting and logging, if you want to have this going to a SIM. So, so companies were tasked with tying all these things together. And okay, some of these capabilities migrated directly to the proxy. Um, that's great, but that meant that there's more that that proxy had to do. Okay, and maybe you know Moore's Law and Silicon advanced and some of the CPU capabilities advanced, that's great. Um, so you can potentially you know, mitigate some of the performance impacts, but still, the impact from an IT perspective was tremendous. Um, you had to tie all this together. Uh, the management burden was intense. And ultimately there was a much higher cost of total ownership. Um, and this is a challenge that we see in here consistently from customers that we're dealing with as they talk to us about migrating from kind of on-premise environments to the cloud. And still, even with all those capabilities, you know, cyber crime and the attacks continue to increase and present challenges for us as an organization, as an industry. Um, you know, 400% increase in daily complaints in 2020 after the COVID spike occurred. Uh, you know, phishing attacks, 30,000 daily phishing attacks focused on COVID-19. You know, my, my mother was, you know, working really hard to get a vaccine. I'm very fortunate she was able to get that. But I was kind of concerned daily because she was always trying to find the latest news about testing and the latest news about vaccines. And, you know, she was just one click away from having her, her machine compromised or her credentials taken um, and kind of reused or resold on the you know underground. Um, more and more attacks focused on uh, critical infrastructure um, and just the overall increase 
you know, in in in, in e crime in this lockdown world, um, kind of I think challenged us as an industry to realize we've been spending a lot, we've been deploying a lot, we've been managing more technology than ever, yet these attacks remain. And I think that you know those we have all heard the definition of insanity, which is you know doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different outcome. Um, and I think that's what we are faced with as an industry with respect to this the threat landscape and how we can address this moving forward. Well, our, our perspective at Menlo is different in terms of how we go about protecting users and protecting organizations. Um, you know, we deliver a platform that has a host of capabilities for securing the internet, um, securing you know, web gateways, you know, delivering capabilities via the proxy, um, with a host of capabilities associated with controlling access to SaaS applications, providing um, data loss prevention capabilities baked into that, and providing a platform for zero trust. And our approach is that, hey, look, this notion of detection and you know letting traffic through and pulling out the magnifying glass and trying to see the bad stuff in the Petri dish, we've been doing that for decades now, still not working. We think the right approach is to empower technology with this notion of isolation. And isolation is the concept that is baked into all of our capabilities. It's not an add-on for a subset of users. It is built into everything we do. But isolation providing um, this notion of, uh, of terminating traffic from the internet and Menlo will secure that traffic and then deliver a clean stream to the users by rewriting that web traffic stream. And I'm gonna go into detail about how this works. But I wanna first highlight about you know, kind of how we got here and, and, and why we think that um, no plumbing is relevant and the design goals that were associated with this. So from, from a new plumbing point of view, you know, with the goal of eliminating the endpoint attack surface, we thought about things like, okay, you know, a lot of organizations have endpoints already on their, um, you know, endpoint agents already on their computers, okay? They don't want another one. You know, you already have some version of a VPN. You probably have some other endpoint capability that's looking for, you know, endpoint firewall type of, you know, use cases and looking for viruses and all this kind of stuff. We don't want to have to deploy another endpoint for our users to keep them protected. Um, we want to have a solution that works for both desktop and mobile. A lot of organizations, and we saw this specifically in the COVID lockdown era, you know, the executives were, you know, working from home and they were working on their tablet. You know, my boss doesn't create a lot of PowerPoints anymore. Um, she's great. You know, she has people that does that for her. And in a lot of cases, she works kind of out of a, a tablet mode. Um, and that's great. It's very effective. It's easy to use. Uh, our vision is to make sure that mobile technologies are no longer treated like second class citizens. So when we deliver security capabilities, we want to make sure we address the desktop laptop use case as well as mobile. We want to make sure that the end user experience um, is not impacted. You know, there have been a lot of attempts at providing approaches to new plumbing for security that require end users to jump through a lot of hoops, or maybe the latency is bad, or maybe certain things that worked fine before the security tools to, uh, in place are kind of broken um, via the new security capabilities. So maintaining a native end user experience was essential to our design goals. Um, and so things like the traditional web capabilities of copy, paste, print, all those functions that might be used by the end user on the web browser, which is the new office, we wanna make sure that those remained unaffected. And lastly, um, we wanted to you know, be um, responsible stewards of the compute capabilities of that end user device. So using CPU and memory efficiently. Um, and for us, this, this drove us to this approach of isolation from a, uh, um, a technology that would allow us to deliver new plumbing to keep our customers and organizations safe. So, so let's talk about how this applies to us as, a, as an industry and to end users. Well, I think it first requires us to review the current state of where we are. So this is a, a computer. This is you know, a, a web browser or multiple web browsers in a sense. You know, you're doing a lot of things with these. You, know, you might have a video going, looking at news, um, you know, have feeds coming in from a variety of social media sites, whatever it may be. You know, ultimately, these computers you know driven by browsers and, and web proxies are designed to let traffic in that is their fundamental you know use cases hey let's let traffic in and we'll provide security by scanning okay 
Um, and so what, what does that mean? Well, okay, you have to detect what the bad stuff is and block that. Let everything else in. Okay, that's great. Um, problem is detection is not 100% accurate ever. I want to repeat that. Detection is not 100% accurate ever. That's, I think, what we've learned over the past several decades. Detection's got a lot better from the early days, and that's great. Um, but it is still not 100% accurate. So from a, a Menlo perspective, well, you know, what's what's the problem here? Well, the, the issue is that in a lot of cases, there's going to be a patient zero, this notion of a zero day, zero hour attack. And from a web point of view, you know, the end user's client is doing the fetching and the, and the executing of web traffic. Um, and then it's rendering on that local device. The proxies in place, the proxy may try to scan some of that traffic and, and look for things that are bad and so forth. Um, but ultimately, you know, as things, you know, come through, like uh, the end user's endpoint is going to get compromised in certain cases. A good example might be, you know, if you have some level of malware filtering and kind of the, with looking at risky web categories and this sort of thing. Okay, if, if it's known good, you're probably going to let that through. That's great. Um, you know, if it's known bad, you can block it. You'll have, you know, malware scanners, you know, to help pick up the slack. But there's going to be this category of unknown. Maybe it's a new website that just launched. You know, you can't always block all that stuff out of hand. So there's this category of access that might be considered risky. You know, if you look at URL filtering tools or anti-malware tools, there's always this kind of risky category. Oh, well, what do you do with that? Well, you, you're probably going to, you know, let it in in a lot of cases because you just can't block everything and you're going to rely on malware and antivirus scanners to keep you safe. Well, the Menlo approach is different, and this is where isolation comes into play. Instead of doing the fetch and execute on the end user device, that fetching and executing happens in our cloud. We have stood up on our cloud platform capabilities that will do this fetching and executing for the end user's client. So imagine you're on your browser, you have a lot of tabs open, um, you're going to this website, Instead of that, that fetching and executing happening on your device, what happens is our surrogate browser in the cloud sees your request. It will then go and do the fetching, executing, and it will do this on the browsers in the Menlo cloud. And then we will essentially mirror the DOM from our browser to that end user's endpoint. And the benefit of this is that the traffic that gets delivered to the user has all the bad stuff stripped from it. So the JavaScript and all the active content, that is removed. So that user's device is getting nothing but clean and secure traffic. And in addition to delivering that type of traffic, we're also able to institute more um, nuanced and compelling controls that are relevant for the contemporary environment. So things like delivering certain pages that might be risky or phishing sites in kind of a read-only mode. And you know, a lot of organizations are focusing on training and educating their users. Well, by delivering to them the, the experience that we feel is safe gives us the ability to empower administrators to have unique capabilities for things like having banners for education. It's like, hey, this site looks like it might be a phishing site. Um, here's why you shouldn't proceed and, and these sorts of things that can be customized to the use cases that are important to your organization's security staff. And, and a new approach is needed because the this, this cyber criminals are becoming more sophisticated. Um, let me give you an example. Um, in 2020, there was this attack called the Dury campaign. Um, and this campaign blew by you know, all the latest and greatest next-gen firewalls and proxies. And what it does is it's, it's considered HTML smuggling. Some of you have probably heard about this. The core capability has been around a while, but we haven't seen a ton of these being kind of productized from a cyber criminal perspective. And the Dury campaign in August 2020 was one of them that was pretty widely executed on. And, and the way it works is this payload smuggles in the HTML, kind of this JavaScript. Um, and the JavaScript is obfuscated. So you know the, the firewalls can't see it. It just sees JavaScript. Um, the file extension is HTML, which is like almost every website's going to have HTML associated with it. So is it malicious? No, because it's just JavaScript. Um, in the cases where it's obfuscated, it's going to be even harder to determine um, what the JavaScript is trying to do. So what happens is that payload, that JavaScript payload, gets sent to the browser. So it passes all the security checks. 
and then the browser will decode the payload. The JavaScript um, will create the blob, the file. It will click the anchor and it will download that file to disk. So at that point, your only hope is that your endpoint security agent can detect that. Um, and I think if we've seen anything over the past several, de several decades, it's that a lot of organizations want to have multiple security layers in place to protect their users. That's why we have firewalls. That's why we have web proxies and email gateways and so forth and IPS systems. In this case, it's going to breeze through all that and you're going to rely upon solely your endpoint to keep you safe. Um, and cyber criminals know this. This attack is a vector that we expect to see more of and we're already starting to see it. And this type of attack demands a new approach. So our approach, as I mentioned, is this notion of isolation. And just to give you kind of a little bit more detail on this. So, so we have these surrogate browsers that live in our cloud platform. And, and this is an important distinction because the benefit of cloud computing is not to take you know, what we were doing for the past 20 years and then just put it in another company's data center. That isn't what you know, AWS, Azure and Google Cloud unlock. Yes, some companies do that. And some of the early pioneers in cloud security capabilities, that was the approach they took. They would rack and stack their own kind of on-premise based architecture, and they would invest and they would scale this out around the world. But what the cloud really allows you to do is to revisit and reimagine how you can do certain things that were done in the legacy form factor. And that's what we've done with respect to isolation and powering our secure web gateway and our secure web proxy. So we have capitalized on the near infinite compute capabilities by the cloud, the near infinite storage capabilities. And that's what delivers this, this remoting protocol that will basically allow us to um, mirror the DOM from our browser to the end user's browser. Um, and so it maintains the scrolling experience, the rendering, the high visibility and high um, resolution, video, audio, flash, all those things that are used are not compromised. All the interactive capabilities are designed um, to be maintained in this type of a use case. And it's deployable to not only desktop capabilities, but also mobile browsers. Um, and we recently shipped that capability earlier in this year. So things like pinching and tapping and all these types of use cases can be powered transparently um, for the user. They don't have to do anything in a lot of cases, they don't even know that it's on in the background. Um, and this is, a, 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 we believe, a, a transformative approach to security. And it will be the, the approach of the future because as we've seen, relying upon detection, you know, that may never go away, but that is not sufficient. Um, and other attempts to deliver this capability, such as you know, VDI and virtual desktop, like we've all used that. And we've all dealt with the lab. We've all dealt with kind of the user experience associated with that. And some of the capabilities and features just didn't translate to kind of the modern web. Um, our model is to keep the modern web intact while providing a new and better approach to security to do that. And that's what's powered by what we call this technology of adaptive clientless rendering. You know, after every session, when the user's done with that web session, that web page, that tab, that gets dumped and trashed and sent to the bit bucket and disposed. So all these things are maintained to continue to provide this consistent user experience while maintaining security um, and privacy for those users. So it's secure with you know, zero malware being allowed through. And we, we've seen even recently in the past couple of weeks, you know, two or three zero days for the Chrome browser. Um, so exploits are completely taken off the table because we are updating our surrogate browsers in lockstep with Google. In a lot of organizations, you know, especially in the COVID era, you know, good luck trying to get a 10,000 organization, 10,000 person organization to update all their Chrome browsers at once. Um, that's going to be a challenge. But with us, we're able to provide this notion of a buffer because we're doing this upgrade kind of, you know, when Google makes it available. So we can provide this sec secure experience for everyone. It's native, any OS, any browser, no endpoint software is required. We predominantly focus on cloud as a form factor. We do deliver this in a, a virtual appliance for some organizations where they have kind of edge use cases where that's relevant. And this allows us to have uh, the ability to take advantage of the elastic cloud and scalability that these co that the public cloud providers can deliver. So, so that's the foundation of all of our security tools. 
So when you think about, well, what does that mean to secure up gateway? Well, secure up gateway needs to have these functionalities such as SSL inspection, um, you know, bypassing SSL, um, you know, having acceptable use policies and URL filtering to block known bad. And you'll probably still want to have antivirus and sandboxing and these sorts of things. And that keeps you safe on the inbound traffic side. And then when it goes to users, you know, navigating the internet and going to SaaS applications, well, you want to have DLP, you want to have CASB and a variety of integrations with existing DLP capabilities. But with isolation, it allows us to, to deliver those capabilities via web proxy, which we do, but also extend those based off of isolation to deliver enhanced capabilities. So yes, as I mentioned, you know, if your users are using out-of-date browsers that have exploits, legacy web proxies can't do anything for you on that. We can, um, because our browsers will be updated as soon as it's available and your users are protected um, and providing kind of this buffer from a patching point of view. Um, we talked about JavaScript. We will see what happens with these you know, HTML smuggling payloads as they exist on our surrogate and we give the ability to block that and prevent that from happening. Legacy web proxies can't do that. Um, and, and the list on the inbound security protection list goes, goes on and on. A good example might be documents. Um, you know, we not only provide isolation for web traffic, we also apply um, isolation for documents that are available on the web. We give admins the policy controls to say, hey, look, you know, if this document is coming from you know, a particular unknown website, I don't want to have that document rendered and delivered to our end users. I want to render that as a safe PDF. And so what will happen with Menlo is someone goes to a website, they want to look at a document. We give them that document, but we convert that to a PDF. And if the customer has various policy requirements and say, hey, we still want to have access to that. Well, you know, we'll allow them to have access to that initial document. Um, and we'll do the scans and checks to make sure that document's safe. And so they can still have access to the original. And these are the types of policy capabilities that are baked into it once you have the isolation core enabled. Um, and, and the same thing goes for DLP and CASB. I mean, CASB is a great example of a use case where we can apply the notion of document isolation intelligently. So say you have CASB set up and CASB is the um, you know, access broker for addressing, you know, kind of, you know, the SaaS applications and deciding what users can go to what SaaS apps and do what things with those SaaS apps. So what we'll do is we'll allow users to say, hey, I'm going to an approved sanctioned SaaS application. Maybe you're using box.net or, or Dropbox or something. That's great. Okay, cool. Allow them to use it, you know, download content because our organization is sharing and doing file sharing and all that kind of thing. But what if uh, users are going to their personal webmail or maybe their personal Dropbox account? Well, in those cases, we can apply document isolation. So you can have it. So if anyone is ever going to a non-sanctioned website for you know file sharing, all of those files will be rendered in an isolated mode from a document perspective, keeping your 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 endpoint safe and your organization safe. So there isn't this level of um, you know circulation of uh, malware from files and, and content from non-sanctioned assets. And in addition to the overall security capabilities that isolation inserts, it also just gives a variety of other types of policy uh, uh, knobs that are available for your organization. Um, a good example would be bandwidth policy. So it's not uncommon for companies to say, hey, you know what? Um, I want to have controls for how much bandwidth people can download from certain types of websites you know, over the course of the business day. That's, that's a good use case, very valid. A lot of companies do it. But we can go one or two steps deeper and say, hey, you know what? You know, in, in maybe instead of just having very coarse limits, you can you may want to have controls for rendering the resolution differently. So instead of high resolution video, you can have it so for certain categories of sites, it's kind of the lower resolution video that is enabled by you know kind of the video players that are baked into that. Um, those are the types of capabilities that are available. Um, and the same thing goes for things like um, accessing uh, social media sites. You know, we work with a lot of financial institutions and banks, and they have these high, high volume, very you know profitable trading organizations where they're buying and selling assets, and they need to have their fingers on the pulse of the market, understanding what users are doing, where they're going, 
um, responding quickly to new information that comes in. But those organizations don't want their employees to post because they can't manipulate the market. So what can we do for them? Well, in a lot of companies can say, hey, you know, block or, or not let someone in to various, you know, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, that kind of thing. But what we're able to do is say, hey, we'll let you get past that login page because you need to log in to get your credentials and we have the controls to do that. But from there, there on, we'll make it so it's read only. You can still you can still kind of navigate and go to clicks and say, hey, I want to look at this story because it looks interesting. But what we won't allow the users to do is to post. And, and this is something that resonates and we have a lot of our higher end financial organizations uh, doing just this. So this policy flexibility extends to kind of the isolated browser session where you have kind of the read, write, um, read only, as well as upload, download controls, as well as the, the, the non-browser um, and the non-isolated browser use case, um, providing kind of that level of granularity and accessibility. Um, we, we've talked a lot about CASB as a use case. Um, and you know, this cloud access security broker is, is one of the newer capabilities in the past you know, decade or so that gives organizations the ability to see what in the heck their, their users are doing from a SaaS point of view. You know, what are the, the, the top sites that our users are going to? And this notion of sanctioned IT, you know, there's a lot of use cases that exist here. What we've seen with a lot of our organizations is, in some cases, they, they, they have really the need to focus on a couple key things. One is knowing what my users are doing, and we give the ability to see, you know, which apps are going to, how much data they're accessing. So we'll give kind of the meters of, you know, downloaded data and that kind of thing. Um, we'll have it associated with that, the risk rating, so they can see, hey, you know, you have certain users going to these SaaS apps that are probably risky, maybe you want to control that. And so we give the ability to have, you know, user policies for uploading and downloading on a, a kind of a user and group basis. And then, as I mentioned earlier, the policy controls that are very granular. So maybe you want to isolate certain web, uh, web applications um, to prevent malware propagation or potentially do a read-only model for you know, accessing content uh, based off the role and the type of uh, app they're going to. Um, and a close cousin that's very much converging with the CASB use case is DLP, where, okay, you have the ability to control what assets and applications people are going to, but at the same time, you're going to want to make sure you inspect that for um, pr protecting information, compliance reasons, and a whole host of, of privacy controls. Um, and so the combination of DLP CASB in isolation allows to give that level of visibility while maintaining the, the efficacy of the existing DLP solutions that you might have in place from an on-premise perspective. So being able to integrate with on-premise um, kind of DLP tools for, for ICAP and that sort of thing is one of the primary use cases for you know kind of our on-premise kind of proxy chain uh, model that we might see some customers deploying. And then as, as we, we get towards the end, um, you know, it's important to note that as we, we talked about the changes that have occurred since the initial proxies were invented with users everywhere, you know, backhauling traffic and that kind of thing. Well, in the modern world, you want users to just get on the internet wherever they are and, and to have that type of security. And that's one of the benefits of having a cloud footprint is having direct access to the internet um, that has the uptime requirements, the um, policy controls with no latency and make, maintaining the backend kind of uh, failover and all these sorts of capabilities to have the user experience be elegant, simple, and, and delightful. Um, and having a cloud footprint is key for that. You know, we'll have users for our customers that are all over the world. And you know, in the old days, you might have a couple data centers that you're managing, but realistically in today's environment, you need to have data centers everywhere um, so they can have access to the web um, in a low latency, secure environment. So, so our, our platform delivers these capabilities via a variety of, of kind of vectors. You know, we've talked a lot about the secure web gateway, secure web proxy. Um, we also deliver similar capabilities on the email fronts. And, and ultimately these converge to deliver, you know, both threat prevention um, as well as data protection. And so when you talk about things like zero trust, well, you know, in many ways, our approach to internet access is zero trust, um, but also providing the foundation for zero trust when you go back into your own data center and your, your teams are accessing capabilities and, and data and applications that might live in your private cloud 
um, or in a data center that you're managing. And, and for us, you know, our leading customers, you know, see the benefit of this. This is a snapshot of, of one of our regions where we have, you know, a lot of our, our customers' um, traffic kind of being reported. And we're seeing in, in our customer environments, you know, well over, you know, 90%, 99% of our top customers who are doing a lot of sensitive, um, you know, kind of sessions because they're, you know, DOD, finance, healthcare, regulated industries, where they're isolating, you know, well over 90% of the traffic on a regular basis. And overall, 87% of the traffic that's sent to Menlo from our customers is isolated. The, the traffic that might not be are things like um, Microsoft O365. You know, they've been pretty vocal about, um, you know, vendors allowing traffic to go directly to them because they have a host of capabilities that might be in place. So we allow some of that traffic to not be isolated as it gets sent to them directly. And, and the same goes with documents. Um, I mentioned document isolation is a very critical component here. Well, in, in our case, you know, for our customers, 85% of the documents never reach the endpoint. Okay, so imagine that, you know, you have users who are going out to the internet, the wild, wild west, and, and they're able to still do their job because we will convert those types of files into a safe viewing type of format and model, and therefore giving them the, the safety that they need while not impacting their work. And that's a critical element here of any of these types of use cases and concerns that customers wrestle with when they're thinking about going from on-premise to kind of the cloud web uh, gateway is, hey, I wanna make sure that I can not only deliver security, but also potentially unlock productivity and, and rethinking how um, we provide that as a critical element of any security transition. So as, as we draw to a close, you know, I, this is a snapshot of some of the customers that are using Menlo um, and the types of segments where we've had a lot of success. So obviously government and defense, um, you know, we have a very large partnership and relationship with the Defense Information Security Agency um, and the entire DOD as they see the benefit of this as kind of a, um, a new model for them to deliver security to their agencies, their multi organizations and so forth. And, and a lot of this is predicated on our core philosophy at Menlo Security, which is, you know, we're, you know, some companies talk about trying to, you know, stop threats. We want, what we want to do and we want customers to think about is protecting work and protecting productivity. And there are a lot of different ways to do that. We think cloud capabilities, predicated on new approaches such as isolation are fundamental and paramount to that. And that's what we want to do. So thank you for your time. If you have any questions, feel free to drop them in the chat. We have a few minutes left to discuss them. Or if you have any other questions and you want to talk to someone to get more detail and go through a demo perhaps, feel free to hit us up at uh, menlosecurity.com backslash product uh, dash demonstrations. So thank you for your time. And I'll kind of hand it back to Charles and uh, the moderation crew. Well, thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me. Well, thank you, Nick. That was uh, very interesting. You had a lot of uh, material that, uh, you know, I've been around since before HTTPS. In fact, I've been around since before HTML, but um, that's a story for another day. <laughs> but you provided a lot of information that uh, either, you know, tweaked my interest and, and got me thinking about things. So, uh, uh, that was uh, uh, very useful. And so uh, I have a few questions. Uh, they're not really uh, uh, in, in our chat that much right now, but I wanted to uh, uh, hit some of the areas that I thought was really interesting to to delve on to some more. And one, you said you, you mentioned that customers can create banners to help educate their staff uh, about a bad site, I guess, they're visiting or, or material. So does, does Menlo Security provide this detailed reporting on what was uh, cleaned or, 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 or purged, or however you want to do it, uh, to the customer, so they can see if they're being targeted or how they're being targeted. Yes, absolutely. We have we have a couple of tools for that. Um, you know, as you mentioned, we have kind of I would say at the at the tip of the spear. You know, we have these banners that admins can customize. So let's say um, you know they have rules in place for phishing sites. You know, a lot of customers use this notion of isolation for protection against phishing. Um, so what will happen is, okay, the user clicks on a link. Um, you know, we have an email product that will basically, when they click on the link, link it goes to Menlo's cloud and it's rendered in isolation. Um, and what we'll do is, you know, the admin can provide 
text that says, hey, this website is suspicious and it looks like a phishing site um, and you know, based off of the risk scoring algorithm or whatever. Um, and you know, it's, it's done to provide this kind of real time feedback to the user so they will kind of know that, hey, look, not all you know, websites that look like they're purporting to be a bank or one of these online payment tools is not who you think it is. We're security professionals, we live that, we know that, but there are a lot of folks, you know, they're on the go, they're moving quickly. Um, that's not always, you know, something that they're really focused on or paying attention to. So we'll give kind of the marrying of the, the rendering of these educational coaching banners, you know, back to the admin so they can kind of see what the user did and, you know, hopefully they'll get a better understanding of that. We also have this product called the browser recorder. Um, and the, what the browser recorder does is it captures the data of a user's web session and it sends it to our customers, you know, kind of storage facility, whether that's in the customer's Amazon infrastructure or on their premise, you know, in their environment. And the browser recorder captures the screenshots of where they were going. It captures the HTML, the CSS, all the, the, the data that is seen by our surrogate that re-renders the page for the user. We can capture all that, including the input detail that the user puts into the website so we can have that available. So if there is a potential security concern or maybe they want to understand what a user did, maybe it's a DLP violation, the administrators have the ability to say, hey, look, the log said this thing happened at this time, this, this event happened. Let me go see exactly what the user did. Now, there are other ways to get that information. Okay, you might have a SIM, you might need to you know, go through logs. And in some cases, companies have done packet capture to try to stitch all that together. But the use cases are typically around the user saying, hey, I went to this site. I, I may have uploaded my credentials. I'm not sure. I don't know what credentials I used. The, the behavior was really weird after I did that. Well, in this case, the, the SOC teams, you know, the Security Operations Center can go to our browser recorder data, pull up the file for that session and see what the user did and then respond accordingly. So we have a, what you highlight is a very relevant and common occurrence, which is you know, kind of responding to phishing types of incidents and this sort of thing, as well as just overall threat hunting. And I think the other use case here is very much that where you have, you know, security teams who are looking, you know, at the internet, trying to understand what the threats are and trying to see what might be the cause of risk. Well, they can do that through Menlo securely because we are isolating that endpoint from the traffic. And we're also obfuscating where they're coming from. So in this case, they can go to these websites, investigate, they can get all that data, and then they can better learn, understand about how to protect our users from uh, those types of attacks. So those are very common use cases that we have tools. For. Very interesting, the threat hunting uh, aspect uh, to that. Uh, we have time probably for one more question. So I'm gonna ask about how uh, Menlo Security integrates uh, and or complements a company's existing zero trust uh, efforts. Yeah, sure, certainly. So, um, you know, I think, you know, one of the, the, the cornerstones of our philosophy is, hey, look, we have to realize that customers have a lot of security tools in place um, and we had to find ways to integrate with our ecosystem. So in those cases, um, you know, we have the ways to, you know, when they're going about their zero trust future to integrate with their kind of perimeter devices. So let's say you have firewalls from, you know, pick the vendors of choice, you know, Palo Alto, Fortinet, et cetera, Cisco. Um, you know, we can integrate with those. And so those devices can forward traffic to us that we can kind of run it securely. Or similarly, you know, when they're going to applications internally, you know, we have ways to integrate with their existing infrastructure to provide this notion of zero trust. So let's say there's customers who are looking to, you know, manage controls for going into, you know, their own data centers or their own applications. You know, one of the capabilities that we are developing is the ability for unmanaged devices to come in um, and you know, maybe a contractor or partner and as they kind of log in to get access, we can put those you know, requests for internal access for the zero trust perspective into isolated web sessions. So they can have, uh, the customers can have that level of security, visibility, and enforcement of policy for those users coming in without those users having to deploy anything on their agents. And so those are the, the types of integrations and capabilities that we're rolling out you know, kind of this summer from a zero trust point of view that we're really excited about that will help customers navigate this journey towards zero trust and kind of a digital transformation. 
Very good. Very good. So probably don't have time for another another question, but because uh, I want to uh, get to our uh, Amazon gift card winners and remind everyone else. But I want to again thank uh, you, Nick, for a very interesting uh, activity. The scale is just amazing on the, the number of SaaS applications and and uh, what we're being uh, attacked and how it's being related, uh, the situation. And as you say, the the environment has changed and we need to stay uh, current. And I think uh, uh, you presented a, a good case for how Menlo Security will keep us current. Uh, and uh, for the audience, I thank you for spending about an hour of your time with us. If uh, uh, you wanna go back and, and learn uh, more about this uh, material or share it with uh, other people, it, it is available on demand. You will receive an email uh, from the email that uh, you registered with that will uh, provide you with the link. But if you don't have a link, you can always uh, go to uh, securityboulevard.com and uh, find it on, on demand there. So our four winners for the Amazon uh, $25 gift cards are Steve W, Tom T, Martin C, and Deborah W. So if you're one of those uh, four people, you will receive an email again at the email that you registered at. Uh, so again, if you don't see it, check your spam filter as, as we like to say, and uh, uh, check and that will have information on how you can collect your card. Thank you, uh, Nick. Thank you, audience. Uh, I hope you will join us for another Security Boulevard webinar in the future. And uh, with that, I'm going to sign off and we will see you next time. Thank you.